you for uh, taking a few moments to sort of have a sort of like a fireside chat with me about how to deal with um, the everyday periodontal patient. But uh, if I can take some latitude, I would also like to suggest uh, technology to manage the everyday periodontal patient uh, as, as we embark on a somewhat of a new environment. So uh, as I have a conversation with you, I, I will put in some caveats of uh, where we are uh, now versus where we may have been before in managing periodontal patients. And when I mention technology, uh, I'm, I also want to take some latitude there and not just discuss uh, what we can consider to be techno, techno, techno. In my mind, uh, nutraceuticals uh, is technology, uh, is innovation, and uh, please appreciate that as we have these conversations, uh, pretty well almost everything I suggest to you, uh, it's just the periodontist in me, uh, will be backed up with, with science. Uh, we periodontists do not do well with uh, just anecdotal. In fact, we are the world's worst uh, when it comes to adopting. Uh, we want to know about research, we want to know what animals, and et cetera. So uh, I think you can feel fairly confident uh, that when I do have some uh, arenas that we move into, that for the most part, I pretty well have taken a look at everything. Uh, also, by the way, and it's just also my nature as an educator, uh, as you see the, the title and you, you see my uh, email, uh, every slide that I am going to show you tonight, I'll be more than happy uh, to send to you uh, on a PDF file in color. It will be a drop uh, Dropbox link. You do not have to have Dropbox to be able to do that. And, uh, but I will send it to you in the next uh, 24 to uh, 48 hours. Uh, and so, uh, but because it is critical, you know, I, I'm a pragmatic, pragmatic individual. Uh, you and I could have an esoteric conversation if you, if you want that, but I like, I like take home things. I, I like pearls. Uh, I like to know what I can do uh, tomorrow with my patients to make a difference. Um, if you've ever heard me have conversations before, I'm very much into mission. I'm a Stephen Covey person. And in my mind, in a dental practice, no matter where you are in the world, in my mind, there are three things, if you're a practitioner, that becomes very important to you. One, the quality of care. Two, that you're content and happy doing it, both mentally and physically. And three, we've got to be financially responsible. I don't believe that's mercenary. I, I, I believe that many of you on this call are in a small business. Uh, some of you are concerned about the future of your small business and dentistry more than any time in your career. So it's not about us making more money so that we can go out and buy ourselves something. It's about us being uh, financially aware of what it's going to take to be able to start back and be able to see a good return on our investments and the fact that, number one, we're getting the quality of care that we need. So what we will experience today is, is four things. Uh, creating a realistic uh, non-surgical therapies and surgical therapies. Uh, looking at new anti-inflammatory systems from nutraceuticals to probiotics. Possibly looking at air delivery medicaments. Uh, determining the efficacy of different kinds of laser wavelengths. And yes, I will pepper this entire conversation we have with laser. Uh, I've been in the laser game since 2008. Uh, I am not an innovator. I'm not an early adopter. Uh, but I absolutely believe that as we pursue this, that a laser will be the standard of care in managing most periodontal disease. Uh, we will review current techno of what to do in the bathroom. What I mean by that is what patients uh, are going to do, uh, do, you know, for their oral hygiene. 
And then if you don't mind, I love patient scripting. I've done my share of in-office periodontal consulting. And I always believe that we should have scripting. We shouldn't be doing ad lib. And everyone should be saying the same thing as we pursue this. Now, as every speaker should do, um, there are, uh, I have conflict of interest. Um, you know, so I have a declaration of things that if I speak to you about, you know that maybe if it's Phillips, uh, I got a free toothbrush from Phillips. Uh, VoiceWorks uh, with Florida Pro, I uh, helped start that uh, company and it's very viable right now. Uh, uh, Hugh Freedy, uh, Probiora, and, and naturally Biolace. So th those are my, my declared conflict of interest with you as we pursue that. Uh, it's not that I'll ignore those, but I'll put them in perspective so that we'll look at all products if that's okay with you. Now, I've always had three axioms of success when it comes to looking at how to be successful in managing the periodontal patient. Yes, they're a little facetious, but mm, maybe during this time, a little levity is probably not a bad thing. So if I wanted to be successful in a managing periodontal, and I must tell you that, and this is why I gave you my, um, my email at the very beginning, uh, because I get, call, I get calls, emails, and I'm trying to write as fast as I can. Uh, and I know some of you, you see Sam's axioms for successful periodontal therapy. You say, my goodness, that must be really important. Well, hang on. If I want to be successful in periodontal therapy, I'd move every three to five years. I like that one. Out of sight, out of mind. If I placed implants, I'd move every one to three years. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Now, I'm a periodontist. I know out there, there's some dedicated dentists that love to do perio or you wouldn't be on this thing. I also know that there's quite a few hygienists. My hat is off to you. So when we talk about dedication to perio, I think you'll love the next one. Just take out the molars. In fact, if it were me, I'd take out the maxillary molars first. If I had any time left, I'd take out the mandibular molars. What did I have left? I'd take out uh, those maxillary first premolars. But with that, I'm being facetious, but I'm also being serious. Did you know that if I counted the, of the 32 teeth, if I counted of the 32, you know how many of those 32 actually have 93% chance of being lost? Only 10, only 10 teeth. And the reason for that is, hmm, I know you don't wanna hear it, but it's called perca. Percation, 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 percation. So as I talk about technology, whether it be the patient or whether it be you, you've got to find a way to get into those concavities. Because my friends, if you do not disrupt that biofilm, then there's no use you waking up in the morning to manage periodontal patients. I hope I'm being about as candid as I can be. I need you to stop scraping on those roots. I need you to start you stop using snake oil. We need to blend what you know from experiential with science. So my last one is, I know hygienists would love this, just extract every other tooth, because you'd have incredible access if you did that. So I was in London doing a program, and you know, I looked at, I saw this van, and I said, my goodness, what more could you want? Till I talked to the driver and found out that this is a van that removes gum from the floors of museums. Well, wouldn't this be wonderful if you had this driving around, especially now, with, you know, because there you would go to their homes instead of them coming to you. So you want to talk about takeout pizza during this time? Well, here you can have takeout perio. So therefore, I love my mythology. And in mythology, periodontal disease is not caused by bacteria. It's not an infection. It's a chronic inflammatory disease. Periodontitis does not get worse over time. It only gets worse if the host lets it. Flossing, you gotta be kidding me. There's not any science, any meta-analysis, any systematic studies that demonstrate that flossing is advantageous for a periodontal patient. I didn't say we weren't gonna use something, but it's not gonna be floss. Root planning, you may have heard me say this before. What are you trying to do? Find the pulp before the patient dies? Root planning is over. 
Scaling is over, especially now. We'll talk about that. Biologic width, nah, -uh. it's not self-limiting. And can we maintain five millimeter pockets? I hope we can, because I got a lot of them in my patients. The probably most growth center in dentistry right now is periodontics. It's periodontics. And if you look at the CDC, I'm not talking about mild periodontitis early, I'm talking about moderate periodontitis. And so whether you be a periodontist, a dentist, or a hygienist, I'm gonna take you through all three on how, if you're a dental hygienist, how you can manage early. If you're a dentist, how you can manage moderate, and I don't mean non-surgical. And if you are a periodontist, how you can manage that 10% in a minimally invasive way to be able to save teeth. And that is really what the bottom line is. So as we look at this, there's no doubt that we've got to sell perio. And my friends, it's not easy to do. I've been a periodontist for 35 plus years. So you can talk about spread of infection. You could talk about loss of teeth. Uh, you could talk about uh, periodontal surgery. Uh, you could talk about floss or die, but you've got to create environments by which patients relate to and they, you're going to get a positive case acceptance. So for my international friends, forget about uh, number two with the codes, but no matter where you are, you've got to be looking at these four things. What's your percent of gross from dental hygiene? What's your percent of dental hygiene or perio codes? What percent of your examinations should be perio, new patient exams? And what's your cancellation no-show rate? So the greatest potential is periodontics. And you do need to assess a fee for periodontal probing. But Roger Levin says one bullet that I think is the most critical. And that bullet is education equal treatment acceptance. So I want us to start balancing the calculus and what's on the root with how the body is responding to that. In my mind, that is the shift. I'm not ignoring oral hygiene. I'm not going to ignore you using a curet or ultrasonic. I'm not going to ignore you using a blade. But start thinking about gingiva and its response as much as you would think about trying to scrape on roots. Those days are over because everything now demonstrates it's a microbiome that initiates the periodontal disease, but it is the host that perpetuates it. So everyone is different and everyone initially is genetically either resistant or susceptible. I don't care what you do. You got a 90 year old guy comes in the office, you look at the mouth, he starts bleeding. You look at the radiographs, the bone is within two, three millimeter of the CEJ, just to fight everything you learned in high school, in high school, in hygiene school, and in dental school. My friends, he's genetically not susceptible to perio. And it wouldn't matter whether it be coronavirus, it wouldn't matter whether it be perio. Genetics has a great deal to do with susceptibility and resistance. So therefore, I'm a big fan of this. I have no financial wherewithal with it, plus it's free. But you need to know who's hot and who's cold. Because it's not about what you do, it's about knowing your patient that you're going to do it on. So therefore, uh, Previsor is fantastic. I mean, it's an online, uh, to where you can put your patient's data in, probably takes a minute or two. So I'd ask you to, to do a demo on, on Previsor because it's a great risk assessment for perio, uh, for caries, and, and also for uh, oral oncology. It's excellent, highly, highly recommended. But you know something, before we go any further with our techno, here's techno for you. Do you see the top slides? You want techno? They're your sensors. I think if I saw that, you know something, I'd rather go backwards than give me a dip tank because I can't see what I need to see with those sensors. But if I see the very same patient down below, which by the way is Foster Blades, which is more like your number two film, then that to me, 
I need to see service areas. So I don't care. So my point is this, don't get so hung up on technology that it undermines the quality of what you want to do. Don't get into this hurting mentality because Jane has this, you need that. That's the early adopter. Be the early majority. Think, is this going to do, is this going to do, am I going to be able to get, am I going to be able to, is this going to do clinical results? Am I going to be able to implement this thing? And am I going to get a return on the investment? And if I buy technology, am I going to get versatility or does it only do one thing? We'll talk about that. So you got to look at the depth of the sulcus because radiographs and depth of the sulcus is what makes us tick. So when you look at these kinds of things relative to a newer established patients and things of this nature, um, and this is one of my conflict of interest. You know, one of the reasons uh, our team created VoiceWorks is because we knew you didn't like charting. So what if, you, uh, what if a dental hygienist had this little microphone with a little elf on their shoulders and everything they said within reason appeared on the chart? That's what I would want. No dental assistant coming in, no moving over to hit the keyboard, everything in that chart looking like this. That is what even third parties like. Black is good, red is bad, implants, things of this nature. You sell perio off these charts. So therefore, also, we need to supply those dental hygienists out there with technology too. And when I say technology too, I also mean looking at such things as um, the, the utilization of loops and light. Uh, we need to move beyond just using the overhead light every time we turn around. And so therefore, I have nothing to do with this company. There's several companies uh, that are out there. Uh, but when you're going to get loops, if you're a hygienist, don't get 5X loops. What are you trying to find, an enamel rod? No, what you want to do is get wide angle lenses, two and a half X with a light. Lights are critical. I don't need you moving that light. Plus right now, I doubt you're gonna be able to move the light because of infection control. So, and by the way, they do make face shields with a little hole to where the light goes through uh, if you start looking through for various companies that are out there. So, when it really comes down to it, there are four buckets of patients. Uh, there's the gingivitis patient, there's the early periodontitis patient, there's a moderate periodontitis patient, severe periodontitis patient. Now you probably saw that earlier, I said early periodontitis was like 10% and that's probably more. Depends on who you take a look at. I trust the CDC, which actually says 47.2% of patients have periodontitis, about 10% are early. Uh, meaning about uh, 30 are in that moderate to periodontitis range and severe taking out the rest. So this is the periodontist in me, also being a card carrying member of the American Academy of Perio. Yes, we do have a new classification system. Um, depending on who you talk to, it's not the easiest thing to adapt to. Um, but having said that, if I look at the classification system, one of the very positive things about it is, is that it did introduce not only the patient relative to their diagnosis, but also introduced something called grading, which is what we call risk assessment. So it's a great system. So therefore, unless you and I talk about selling perio, probably now more than ever, if you look at core comorbidities of coronavirus, I'm sure all of you are aware of it, that when you look at hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, respiratory diseases, obesity, that that environmental aspect already on top of a genetic scenario is, is really creates validity on where, what we're looking at and who's susceptible and who's resistant. Probably now more than ever, you as a oral health professional should be talking more now than ever about the oral systemic link. And I'll just leave you with that. So when we take a look at that, 
If you look at these and you look at the comorbidities, you'll notice that periodontal disease is right in the middle of one of the major human chronic inflammatory diseases. And in fact, the World Health Organization puts periodontal disease as the sixth most prevalent chronic inflammatory disease that exists. So therefore, you may think that's a little bleeding pocket. If you look over on the right, it's a portal of entry. And if you multiply that times mesial, distal, buccal, lingual, circumferential, and 28 teeth, it's substantial. So now let's start to look at some techno stuff. Yes, I do highly recommend that you take omega-3 for chronic inflammatory diseases, including perio, at a good 900 to 1,000 milligrams a day. And fish oil is still the best. Yes, I do believe that you need to be taking aspirin at probably 81 milligrams a day. It has nothing to do with vascularity, but it has to do basically with anti-inflammatory. We'll talk a little bit about probiotics. We'll talk a little bit about topical antioxidants. But if you want to manage perio, don't just manage it from oral. Don't just manage it from systemic. Manage it both. Because it's uncanny about how oxidative stress affects both the systemic and the intraoral. So here is, I mentioned about periosciences. Uh, here is the antioxidant gel uh, that we use. You can see how it substantially reduces inflammation. It also has a major effect on xerostomia. And you say, well, why can, how could a gel that it has anti-inflammatories plus uh, methylthamol and um, azotitol, how could it affect xerostomia? because we now know that xerostomia is inflammation of the minor salivary glands, not the majors. The majors are affected by radiation, but all those meds that we're now taking, about 2,300 different categories, those meds are what is affecting xerostomia, especially patients on anti-anxiety, antidepressants, and some hypertensive medications. So if you want to know more about periosciences, uh, just Google it and you'll find it. So we're in the direction now of closing the gap in what we call oral healthcare products. I'm suggesting that you need to be considered to be almost like a retail center. Again, I uh, have done some work in the past with uh, this probiotic. I enjoy it, part of it because it was actually discovered at the University of Florida, which is uh, where I reside. Uh, but this is based, this is an oral probiotic and it has science behind it. There are others out there, but probiotics, oral probiotics may become probably the most important in oral hygiene. First of all, you get higher compliance, it's a tablet, mint, put on your tongue, suck on it, swallow, and it runs out all the bad bacteria not only caries, but also perio. And there are some studies on even on pulpromonas gingivalis. So this thing goes into the sulcus. Uh, this thing can actually attach on the root, uh, on root surfaces and on the tissue itself. So you may want to investigate the area of utilizing a, a oral probiotic today. And by the way, some of these probiotics actually exhibit hydrogen peroxide some of the organisms in these viable organisms, where they're freeze dried and then they become active when they're in the mouth and actually whiten the teeth. So I feel for you out there, managing perio is not the easiest thing in the world. Why? Patients don't want it. Uh, secondly, not easy to implement. So you've got to sell it. And my thing about selling is always Jane, today you have the irreversible loss of your jawbone. I didn't talk about losing teeth. I didn't talk about dying. You have the irreversible loss of your jawbone. And when you do that, then you can plug them into this decision tree. I'm indebted to the American Dental Association for creating this. Let me remind you, I will send all this to you on a P.
feed with them. So when it comes to oral hygiene instruction, let's do some tech note. Friends, you didn't get up this morning and make a phone call with a rotary phone or a push button phone. I think you picked up an Android or an iPhone. Manual brushes, it's over. You gotta have electric, you gotta have power. You get an 81% higher compliance when you use electric. The first time you use electric toothbrush, and I'm talking techno in the bathroom, wasn't that the longest 30 seconds of your life? So I don't care if it, you know, they, they can talk to you, they can tell you when to brush, how to brush, where to brush. You can't lie anymore because it actually can be recorded by the dentist. But the bottom line is 30 second, 30 second, 30 second, 30 second. You need something for compliance. So whether it be Oral-B or one of my favorites, uh, Sonicare, it doesn't matter to me, but use brushes that have science. I love this thing. Some people have mixed emotions. But for me, I like techno, and this is techno. You probably aren't aware, but inside there uh, is almost like a Tesla. Inside there is a, a lithium battery. And you could not get the microburst out of this thing without a lithium, the lithium battery. So this is actually photoacoustics. We're going to talk more about how important photoacoustics are. So can I recommend, please, do your oral hygiene at night. Don't do it in the morning. You can brush and floss, do whatever you want, but at night you're mine. You got to do your oral hygiene at night. There's so many reasons why you get microbiome buildup, biofilm buildup at night. Your mouth is closed. There's no saliva, so forth. Manna from heaven. Wow. This is what I'm using instead of dental floss. This will disrupt the biofilm. These will disrupt the biofilm. Because remember, this is periodontal lecture. So as we look at that, from that standpoint, I always bring this out. Uh, this slide was made in like 1961 by a periodontal instructor at the University of Washington. It shows you that floss is never gonna get into those perka, 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 that we discussed. So, when it comes to the whole thing of ultrasonics, hmm, uh, we're gonna have to sort of rethink some of maximizing ultrasonics in this day and time. Uh, this is not the time for me to go through all the nuances of this, but you need to use ultrasonics that have decreased water spray. Uh, you need to drop your water down. You, you need to use the appropriate PPE. Uh, you need to have patients um, doing pre-rinses. I really believe that the one that's gonna come out is gonna be 1.5% hydrogen peroxide. You've got to have quality HVE. You've got to have high evacuation going on here. So with that, we probably will see the blend of more and more of what we consider to be manual re-instrumentation. More manual instrumentation, especially on the prophylaxis patient. On the periodontal patient, I'm still going back to ultrasonic, minimizing my aerosol, understanding my PPE, understanding protocols as we go through this. So therefore, there may be, to a certain degree, a little bit more polishing, although now you have to be concerned about the spattering. And you definitely can't use your air water syringe uh, to the degree that you had in the past. So for the most part, it's just called changes. But changes are sometimes a good thing for us. Uh, for gross debridement, I will tell you that if you don't use an ultrasonic here, uh, it's going to be purgatory for you. But you don't have to have these high power settings and these high aerosol delivery systems. And there's probably no doubt that piezo is probably, we know is probably 50% less water than magnetostrictive. But that's up to you. So there are designs out there. There's power settings out there that we do. There's different tips out there that we use. But we're probably going to end up, at least for the next few months, using a few more manual instrumentation than we did in the past. That's just probably the way it's going to be. And I'll be more than happy to send you some of the systems that, that I discuss. So when we talk about antibiotics, uh, that's not techno. That's a step back. You only want to use those systemic antibiotics 
for patients that have aggressive periodontal disease. You don't want to create antibiotic resistance. And so therefore, uh, you need to be very, very careful. But when you have a patient like this, yes, you do need to use them because this is a 19-year-old African-American male that has generalized old terminology, juvenile, sort of new terminology, aggressive periodontal disease. So when you look at these kinds of patients, if you're not careful, you're going to get resistance. And so you can see the before and afters of what it looks like when we complete it. And so local deliveries, uh, I'm not taking anything away from local deliveries. There's several of them out there, uh, but just be um, judicious on how you use them and appreciate that they're still not going to overcome quality periodontal debridement. And there are some studies that are out there that discuss differences with manual instrumentation. So for hygienists that are there, just realize for the most part with this, that the, there is a turnover in practices. Uh, there is full-time versus part-time, uh, but for the most part, we're moving towards an era to where hygienists are not just tooth cleaners. And we do need to increase the hygiene productivity, especially now. And we're gonna have to start concentrating on perio. And we're gonna to have to appreciate that we're gonna to have to talk more because 50% of the dentist production comes from the hygiene operatories. And hygienists are going to need to be a different kind of person. Again, they are not just a person that owns a curette. Uh, they're self-motivation, they have presentation skills, they have conflict resin. And when you do that, you enhance your hygiene productivity. So we need to do periodontal exams. Hygienists must use technology. They need to have loops. They need to have light. When they can, they need to be using ultrasonics. They need to be using uh, airflow, uh, uh, the decimate delivery systems when possible. You need to be throwing away that syringe and thinking about the new computerized systems that are out there for delivering with minimal anxiety for our patients. And so there are other things that are out there, but, but let me start to move towards one of my most favorite applications, and that is laser. Again, I'm going to reinforce with you. I believe that it will be the standard of care in managing periodontal patients. You know that Lasix is lens correction. It's almost like Kleenex. You know that if we discussed this 25 years ago with an ophthalmologist and I said, yeah, we're going to use a laser beam to do this, they would think we were nuts. Some people still think we're nuts using lasers in dentistry. But we're going to chart the future and the present because I know patients. Patients want minimally invasive. Patients want to wake up the next day and feel fantastic. Patients want to feel fantastic as they're leaving your office. Patients do not want discomfort. Patients want, patients want things that they have confidence in, that they know that you have confidence in and can do the job with you. Sorry, but many patients don't want to go somewhere else to have something done. They want you, they have confidence in you. Lasers are now starting to be within reason of cost. Lasers for the most part, are different wavelengths. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But you tell me what you want to do and I will tell you the laser that you need. If you just want soft tissue and you're a hygienist, you want a diode. You see the melanin, you see the red, the blood. But if you're a dentist and you want versatility, a diode is not gonna get you there. Then you need an all tissue laser that does both bone, root, and to a certain degree, also soft tissue. So when you look at each one of these swim lanes, for the most part, in my swim lane over on the left, I've got diodes in there. But for you dentists out there that want to do surgical, minimally invasive periodontitis, then you want to be in the middle swim lane. If you don't feel comfortable on that 10% that's very severe, very aggressive, 
then you move that patient over into a swim lane that you see over on the, the, uh, the right. And there are many of them out there. And they do many, many different things. I like this one because I believe there's something to utilizing for photobiomodulation or TMD or joints. Many chiropractors and vets have this laser. So diode soft tissue lasers, they have advantages, but they also have some limitations. They can cut, they can coagulate. In many cases, topical is fine, a surgical precision, uh, little to no post-operative discomfort because of the uh, photobiomodulation, but they're slow. And for a dental hygienist, because they're not cutting, they're more ideal. So for a dental hygienist, it can do these things, uh, desensitize, herpetic lesions. You talk about a wow factor. Herpetic and aphids ulcer correction with a diode laser, that's a, that's a winner. Laser bacterial reduction and laser curatage and to a certain degree whitening. So there are treatments for oral ulcerations with aphids ulcers and herpetic lesions. And here is using a diode for that. And here is our diode that we would use. Notice that how nice the tip, uh, the handle is. It's very ergonomic to be able to go in and do what you see there. Uh, so in lasers and dental hygiene, you have laser bacterial reduction and you also have laser curatage and debridement. If you are in an area that is regulated to allow a dental hygienist to use a laser, my friends, you, if you don't have a laser, uh, at least a diode laser, you're missing the boat. Because these two procedures are very valid in what we do in perio. So therefore, there is procedures for laser bacterial reduction. The laser energy is able to go in and be able to have an effect on the microflora. And a 980 wavelength is an ideal wavelength for that. And such things as the, like the Epic Hygiene with Biolase has that kind of wavelength that is there. So by the way, I will tell you that I'm moving a little forward and I'm now putting hydrogen peroxide in the sulcus before I do laser bacteria reduction. And I'm indebted to Dr. Odor, a fantastic Romanian periodontist who did great studies on this. And if you email me, I can provide more information for you. So we do have laser assisted periodontal therapy. This is one of my favorites. I thought we should never have taken curatage out of dentistry. To me, it was a mistake from the beginning because curatage is an anti-inflammatory. And so for me, I love curatage with a laser, whether it be an all tissue laser or whether it be a uh, diode laser. So the effects of lasing the pocket are significant. Tissue loosens, allowing for being able to access the epithelialization, denature proteins, gingivectomy, and photobiomodulation. Diabetic foot wound, six months later, diode laser. So lasers are moving. You know, you're the first telephone, you know, the first computer, look how they're moving. They're moving towards being easy to use, simple to use, user-friendly, training being fantastic, energy going in, tips that are the size of periodontal probes, as you can see here. Great results, five years later, top before, bottom after. So with that, Notice that we are now taking lesions that are substantial, huge three wall defect. And now not only using uh, lasers like Repair Perio, but in addition, also using biologics and osseous grafting. We're using it in a variety of areas. Uh, if you're following BioLace, next week is gonna be a great on next Wednesday uh, with Steve Lucarelli, orthodontist who uses laser to be able to uh, expose canines and get tissue out of the way, uh, to put bands on and especially aesthetics. So if you've got the opportunity, uh, dial in uh, next Wednesday for a BioLace uh, a seminar on utilizing lasers uh, in, the, in the orthodontic spectrum. 
we use lasers for depigmentation. I mean, look at this, this is phenomenal that a patient can come in with gum bleaching and that can be done. I would suggest to you, done much faster with an all-tissue laser than with a diode. With a diode, it didn't take you forever. But notice how that is like four weeks later. One of my colleagues, uh, Ricardo Montriani in Mexico City, look at the ability of taking an all-tissue erbium chromium YSGG laser and actually doing aesthetic uh, periodontics a crown link to the point uh, actually doing, look how Ricardo is going in and doing the ostectomy and look at the result. I'm mean, actually, the case came to him for veneers. They walked out of there with aesthetic crown lengthening and whitening and a great, great result. So here's Ricardo also doing one of the new areas in this business and that's removing veneers. Sometimes removing a veneer is like purgatory, but here, He's actually taking an erbium, it has to be done with an erbium, an erbium chromium YSGG, 30 seconds later, popping it on there, takes the resin, does micro implosions in the resin, and notice what happened. It took, it took all the veneers off, and all of them are intact. Now, I don't think he's going to put the ones back on, but if he did, he could literally cement them back on. So let me finish and also talk to you about one of the other areas that becomes very important to us. And that is implants. Implants are wonderful, don't get me wrong. But there is an issue with implants. And that is how do you keep them clean? And if you get implantitis, how do you manage it? Uh, it's not my direction to speak directly to this, but please don't use ultrasonics on implants. Please don't use uh, stainless steel curettes on implants. If you're going to do something, uh, I still believe that medicinal air polishing for mucositis is where you need to go. As long as you have high evacuation and you know what you're doing. And there are many systems out there. Uh, tomorrow, Thursday, I'm doing a program for Panky through uh, Kirk Bernhardt's uh, ACT group around one o'clock tomorrow, and I'm gonna go through a complete of what we should be doing in a hygiene operatory from all aspects of that. So notice 30 seconds later what we get. The only way you can manage implantitis with confidence is gonna be an erbium laser, possibly a CO2, but it depends on what CO2 you're talking about. Not all CO2s can be used on implants if you're not careful with thermal. We've got to save implants, my friends. You know, I was having this conversation with Gordon Christensen. He says, Sam, we have got to figure out a way, first of all, to save teeth. That's why he loves lasers. But secondly, we've got to figure out a way to save these implants. So when you look at the cost of surgery, I would suggest to you that on May 14th, you may want to be with Gordon, myself, and Mike Detola as we talk about how to manage these kinds of, this will be another BioLace webinar. It will be a panel. We're going to just take the gloves off, have a conversation, grow your practice with simple, minimally invasive, patient-friendly periodontal procedures. So stay tuned for that because I do believe that if you're interested in this business on how you as a practitioner can manage this stuff uh, as far as minimally invasive, this is going to be the webinar for you. Because what we're going to talk about is look what the cost of an implant is, and look what the cost is if I have to remove the implant with this and replace it with another implant. The bottom line, let's not remove the implant. Let's use things like lasers. This, is, this happened, just happened to be a BioLace um, uh, side-firing tip but have tips that go into the threads. If you've heard me before, we got things that do this. We don't have things that go into those threads. I need to go into those threads. A great study by Chris Walensky, a Peturo uh, dental school. Uh, he took cement here, you see, after using a side bearing tip uh, where we are. So when we look at this, one of my cases, notice what I can do here. No bone grafting, minimally invasive procedures using an erbium chromium YSGG laser. 
and in a great study by our Japanese colleagues and also promoted by Ron uh, and Mark Nevins, a great study in International Journal of Perry Restorative. Notice how the bone, what we call bone implant contact, moved in to the threads of that after it had been decontaminated with an erbium laser. So let's close. Friends, if you've got a patient that after phase one therapy, still has 45 millimeter pockets, maybe some calculus, edema, friends, that's your case, but that's swimlane one. That's hygienist. That's hygienist. Now, it's not a profi, but that's hygienist. But if after phase one, you've got pocket dips that are five millimeters or greater, no calculus, fibrotic gingiva, angular bone loss, or horizontal bone loss, especially, that's your case. If you're a general practitioner and it's moderate periodontitis, that's your case with laser. Don't be afraid of doing it. But if it is beyond your abilities and it's in that other swim lane, in which uh, you know 10% of the cases that may be aggressive and may be severe, may require some biologics and you don't feel comfortable with that, then refer it to a periodontist. So how do I manage a patient who refuses to see a periodontist? Well, document, document, use pharmaceutical intervention, compromise. What condition should I went to refer to? It? Just the ones I talked about with pocket depths that are greater than five, pocket depths that are deepening and, and you don't do periodontal surgery. If you don't place implants, but shame on you if you don't in 2020, uh, but for the most part, send them to a periodontist. That's what we do. If you don't know how to cover roots, don't try to cover roots. Send them to us. That's what we do all day. You're as good as we are, except we just do it all the time and we have three years of training. But that doesn't mean you cannot do it. So atypical forms of periodontal disease, so recall, recare is the heartbeat. Maintain the retention. Please, please, please look at your cancellation no shows. This is the perio consultant in me. Please, please, please. You may need to expand your hours moving forward. I have a whole litany of what we're gonna to need to be doing that I'll talk with some of our, and by the way, uh, just to let you know, Friday, we will be doing something called Ask the Expert and which we're again we're going to take their gloves off and myself and at least one other periodontist we're going to we're going to listen to your questions you're going to be able to call in and talk to us about what you want or use the chat room and we're going to get down and dirty and talk about you and what you need to be doing and, and especially listening to your issues on where we need to be going with this so therefore you need to be thinking about the 60-minute repair appointment which now may end up being the 45 minute repair appointment because things are probably going to change. You need to be thinking about how we really get attachment. You know, I live and breathe and bleed to a certain degree, Panky. Uh, Dr. Panky and the Panky Institute still now is probably one of the most phenomenal CE institutes in the world. Some of you may have been there. Dr. Pankey had few words, but his words were critical. The goal of my practice is simply to help my patients retain their teeth all of their life if possible in comfort, function, health, and aesthetics. Whether it be an electric toothbrush, uh, whether it be a microfin ultrasonic, or whether it be one of those things that's close to my heart, an all tissue versatile laser, uh, it will be technology. Our patients are going to expect technology even more so. Uh, by the way, you know you and I are going to need to do more procedures per patient than ever before. I hope you know that. Uh, one tooth dentistry, mm -mm. you're going to have to do quadrant dentistry, especially if you're going to be able to pay your overhead on the PPE. But we'll talk more about that. Maybe we'll maybe with some of your questions uh, today, but also when we see you Friday. Uh, so uh, this is our, uh, our webinar that we'll be doing May 14th. If you do want a copy of this, please, you and I are colleagues. We're gonna get through this. We're going to really be able to meet these challenges. We're gonna come out on the other side even better.
So David, I'm gonna turn it back over to you if there are any questions. Thank you, Dr. Lau, for an engaging and informative presentation. Once again, really appreciate you sharing so much of your experience and expertise with the audience all around the world. Uh, I normally just take a, a half second and tell you that uh, I think our furthest participant was Amelia in Christchurch, New Zealand today. So hello to New Zealand, where I think it's tomorrow, actually, Dr. Lau. Uh, but some great comments about the information that you shared. And before getting into q and I will remind everyone that we will have about you know, four or five minutes, so we'll get to as many questions as we can. But as Dr. Lau was kind enough to remind you, he and Dr. Stephen John will be joining us Friday afternoon at the same time, 3 p.m. Pacific time, uh, to go over all of the questions that we've received during the lecture today. So if you don't hear your question asked, please don't despair. Uh, we'll be sure to get to it on Friday afternoon in a very interactive session with uh, Drs. Lau and John. So thank you again. Uh, Dr. Lau, a number of questions. We have about 40 or so, so I'll, I'll sort of start chronologically here and see if we can uh, take a couple off the top. Uh, what settings are appropriate for circular debridement? Currently, uh, this person, Heather, is using the circular debridement setting, but, but uh, could she increase the wavelength? She'd like to know kind of where the safety net is with that. Well, first of all, you always use your default settings on whatever laser you have. Uh, I can just give you very briefly, if, if I'm a hygienist, I've got primarily LVR, laser bacteria reduction, and I've got laser-assisted periodontal therapy. If it's LVR, you want an uninitiated tip, you really don't want to go past 0 0.5, whether that be continuous or if you're using pulsed, average peak power. So for LVR, stay within that 0 0.5, 0 0.7 range. Now, Laser-assisted periodontal therapy is a little different. Here you want an initiated tip. You absolutely want it unpulsed so that you can get tissue relaxation. And for that, yeah, there you can be in that, like that 0.8 to one watt. But I would not go further than that because when you start going further than that, you may end up getting carbonization, you may end up getting charring, and you may have an adverse effect on the root. Please appreciate that for the curatage we're talking about, we rarely ever go over 0 0.8 to one watt pulsed with an initiated tip. Okay. Excellent, thank you, doctor. Uh, the next one is uh, from Rocio. And do you recommend, Dr. Lyle, chlorhexidine irrigation during scaling and root planing? Uh, second part of the question, also oral DNA before SRP. Uh, first of all, about the chlorhexidine. Uh, we are actually determining uh, that now, if you have any secondary wound, including extraction or curatage, you really don't want to use chlorhexidine because it's cytotoxic. I would rather see you use uh, saline or uh, menthol thymol or periosciences, but I wouldn't use chlorhexidine on anywhere there's fibroblasts exposed because we have those studies and I will be more than happy to send those studies to you. Uh, the second part, David, was... I guess when to actually perform the oral DNA testing. Oh, the oral DNA. Uh, if you become uh, into monitoring periodontal disease from a microbial standpoint, um, I, I actually, with oral DNA, unless the patient, if the patient's aggressive, then I might want to do oral DNA before. But if the patient is chronic, especially early, and older in age, uh, I probably, and I, did, and then I didn't get a response as well as I would, then I would do the oral DNA post SRP. So the point being aggressive perio, I would do it pre. If it's a standard uh, chronic periodontal disease in a patient that I would consider to be early to slightly moderate, a little bit more on the resistance side, then I, but I wasn't getting a response I wanted, I would do it post SRP. Excellent, Dr. Lau. We probably have time for a, a couple more questions, but there were a few around the earlier part of your presentation we were going through some of the technology that you employ or recommend. Uh, so a few about water pick versus air floss, and then perhaps the use of those two. Do you have a recommendation, one versus the other? And then the, uh, the, the more specific question was, is, are they safe or is it safe to use in a sulcus around an implant? Perfect. I always believe in mechanical medicinal. Mechanical 
with soft pick or proxy brush and toothbrush, followed by it doesn't really matter to me, whether it be water pick or whether it be um, air floss. But the critical part of it is put a medicament in whatever you use. That is more important than anything. And what was the second one? Uh, sure. Is it safe to use in a sulcus or on an implant? Absolutely. Thank you. It's safe to use in a sulcus or on an implant, but you cannot put it directly into the sulcus. And please do not turn these water irrigation devices over one third to one half. Because remember, a, a, a sulcus in an implant, there, there's a little bit of a junctal epithelium, but there's no connective tissue attachment. So just be careful. I'm, not, I'm just saying use it at a 90 degree angle and turn your power down when it's around again. But you probably should be doing that around T2, natural T2. Uh, doctor, we'll close on a question that's come in a couple different ways. But before we get to that, this is very quick, I believe. You were talking about the probiotic that you prefer and the, the question is about the, the name or the brand of that probiotic again. Yeah, it is, it's Probiora. Uh, it's at Probiora Health. So if you just, you know, like everything else, you Google Probiora, uh, you'll get, uh, uh, you know, you'll get to the website. Uh, it's a sim simple mint. It's got three uh, healthy uh, streps in it uh, that literally the science demonstrates it runs all out the, um, the periodontal pathogens and also the strep mutants like the bacillus. Excellent. And doctor, this is uh, very open-ended. I don't think there's a specific answer to it, but uh, several of our attendees are in states where laser usage is restricted, especially within the hygiene chair. And the, you know, the question or the ask, if I can say it differently, is you know, are you aware of you know, new efforts around that, particularly like in Florida where you reside or in New Jersey where it's a bit gray? You know, what are you aware of in terms of maybe changing minds and, and the effort to get uh, lasers uh, a more uh, accepted part of the armamentarium. Yes, and uh, I'm, you're right, David. It's quite open-ended. Actually, it's a um, it's highly political. Uh, but uh, I would I would suggest to you that it's kind of like local anesthesia, uh, where we thought local anesthesia was going to kill people, uh, till we found out that there's about 40, 47 states now that have it. Uh, if you, if you, if I were to suggest about a state, uh, lasers are not going to have an adverse effect in the hands of hygienists if they're certified. It's all about certification. And my hat goes off to my home state, uh, which is Texas, which has created great uh, regulatory with the Texas State Dental Board around dental lasers for hygienists with 12 hour certification courses. Uh, it, there's not been adverse events in those states, uh, but it really does make such a difference in being able to manage patients, especially those patients that are not going to have periodontal surgery or not see a periodontist. Um, again, it's politically charged, uh, but I, I would just suggest that, that there is information out there you know, we have probably now about 20 plus states that absolutely allow hygienists to use it and a good 15 to 20 more uh, that say you can use whatever you want if it's in the Practice Act. In other words, if in your Practice Act it doesn't say curatage, well then you're not gonna be able to do curatage. Uh, but I do believe, just like we did with local anesthesia, we need to take a really fresh look at this and not be fear-based in our decisions moving forward. 